Ready? Welcome to an Eclipse story about Sysbox. Sysbox is a closed source tool that we use at Infineon for hardware verification stuff, but it's built 99% on open source stuff. And this is what we are going to see today and what we are going to talk about today. My name is Christian. I'm doing Eclipse stuff since more than 10 years right now, um, mostly in the area of scripting. This is what I work on. I live in Austria, so if you want to meet me there, we can go for a beer. If you are more interested in the technical details, look at my blog at codemeblogspot.com. So what we are going to see today, first we're going to have a look on what my company is actually doing. Then you got the background why we are using Eclipse and how we are using Eclipse. Later on, at the second part of the talk, we will see how we do user bonding and user training for our tooling. And the last part, we'll deal with how we try to attract developers to join our effort to have some kind of open source within our company. So as I said, I'm working for Infineon Technologies, which is a semiconductor company, quite a large one. I'm working in Austria and doing chip card development. Chip cards are these tiny computers you can find in your SIM cards of your mobiles. You can find it in banking cards. They're part of your passports lately. And typically, they deal with all kinds of security things. A chip card is really a computer. Actually, they've got memory. They've got ARM cores nowadays. They've got peripherals to input and output data. They run an operating system. And you can download applications on them and run these applications. So you can think of that we need to do a lot of testing before we can ship and sell these cards to our customers. And in the dark ages, <laughs> we asked the working students some, some time back, more than 10 years ago, to build a small software where people can play with these chip cards, send some data to them using a hardware device like a reader like this one here, and retrieve data. So it was just an experiment done in C++. And well, it evolved over time, <laughs> right? <laughs> so people were asking for new features. There were new specifications we had to deal with, and we had to test them. People wanted some kind of automation. They asked things like, can we send data with wrong checksums to just test how the card behaves? So we ended up with tons of buttons, tons of checkboxes. If you look at the lower right corner, we didn't have any place for labels anymore. So this was a time when we knew we are in deep trouble, right? <laughs> So there had to be another concept, another solution for this thing. We didn't want to code this all the time, to build it, to ship it, to test it at the target site, because we often didn't have the hardware in our software lab where we was programming that stuff. So this was hard to do. And we said scripting might be an alternate approach to target our audience. Our audience, well, these were developers, mostly hardware developers. So a lot of them had no clue about programming. We couldn't come up with things like, this is object orientation. Hey, you've got these nice objects out there. Just create an instance and work on it. They didn't know what we are talking about. So when we said we want to come up with scripting, we needed something extremely simple regarding its syntax and the way how you can learn that system to operate with it. On the other hand, we had these young guys on board. They know all about Python. They do want to do number crunching in NumPy and SciPy. And they asked for a full-fledged scripting language. So if we provide them to them, they want to have it all not just simple script commands. And of course, all of this needs an IDE. So the IDE choice was simple. There was Eclipse. It's free, it's open, it's extensible. So we based on Eclipse. And then we looked out for a scripting engine. And we found Rhino, which is a JavaScript interpreter written in Java. So it was a natural thing to take that interpreter, push it into Eclipse, and run it natively in the Eclipse context. What we got by that is not only script execution of JavaScript files, but these files had instant access to everything that just lives in the current JRE. Like we had instant access to all of the views that exist in Eclipse. We had access to the workspace, to all the builders there, to everything that you can access from Eclipse directly. Now we started to augment that stuff with some libraries to help our users out, like giving them some helper methods to access the workspace. Other helpers were there to access chip cards and hardware assets that we are using in our labs. We had libraries for different protocols and so on. The open source part of that framework that, that existed there is now called Ease and is available at eclipse.org. So I would say time for a demo. I'm launching Sysbox right now. And you will see the splash screen, which will get some importance later on. I've got here a reader. This is a chip card reader, a contactless one. So it's emitting an electromagnetic field. 
which powers my chip and my passport in here and also transmits data. So this is this box. This is about scripting. The perspective you get, the scripting perspective is part of ease. Its main part is the script shell up here. And it'll allow you to enter script commands and execute them right away. Some of you might have seen the talk from Rabea two hours ago, roughly, so you know what you can do with this thing. Otherwise, we have lots of tutorials and video material online. For our readers, or for, for our customers, the very first thing they've got to do is they've got to tell us which reader they are using when they have multiple ones in their system. So we have a few for them, which is called Device Manager, down here, which just shows all the hardware assets we have access to. These are not only chip card readers, this is oscilloscopes, climatic chambers, frequency generators, pattern generators, things like that. So we try to automate all kinds of hardware. So I'm selecting the reader I want to communicate with. Then I have to tell the system which kind of protocol is my chip card speaking. So this is a chip card specific thing. I load one of these protocols and then I can send my very first command, which would be a thing called request. The very first thing is not working as the reader is corrected right now on the first attempt. So the second one is working and actually sending some data. What you see up here is quite small, so I copied down the communication down here to the editor. What you see is we just send a data, seven bits, and we receive 16 bits in data in return from our card. We have real Java objects here, so what I've got here is a request command which returns some data. I'm now storing it to a variable. And I can access all the Java methods that sit inside of this Java object. So it's not bound to JavaScript only what we got. We can access Java, as said before. Um, more interestingly for a lot of our testers is seeing real applications. So I'm loading now a module that does government ID, which means actually communication with a passport. There is a dedicated um, specification out there called Archeo. So everything that has to be done, all the commands are stated there. I'm activating my card. I'm activating the passport application. And now I've got to do some authentication to it. Therefore, I have to load some public key. I have the public key in a file called mrz.txt. This is a text that you can find in your passport on the very low part of the, of the very first page. Just loading that. And now I can do an authentication which works on my card and operates. Next thing I can do is I can read files on that chip card. So it's a real file system on there with files. And the very first file contains data about myself. So it contains the name. I was just printing this to the console. So it contains my name, my date of birth, where I'm located at, the, the issuer date of the passport, and things, a lot of things more. This is how people start using ease. They play around with the script shell, see what commands they can use, try it out, get live reaction on, on, on their attempts. And once they've got something working, they store it to files. Because if you have a workflow, you want to repeat that often. Therefore, you don't want to type this all over again. And now I can load these files. This passport file basically does the same. Just it sets up some, some communication channels to the card and sends the commands I did before and creates a little bit nicer output. See, so I just do a pretty print of the data I found just in my passport. Now, these are the first things that people do. Like if we're going to issue cards, for example, for testing purposes, we need to write some data to these cards. People do that by providing these kind of scripts. If you have more than just one file, as scripts could include other files, we needed it MR set, as you have seen, and so on. You can export this as kind of a package. Java has jar files for this. We have script archives for this. This is pretty much the same thing, but instead of having an entry Java file that we run with its main method, we run a script from that. I prepared something, it's called the passport example, and it pretty much does the same thing as we've seen before, just now from an archive file, where everything is packaged in a single file which you can easily ship to customers or to your users. Next thing people want to do is testing. Most of the things actually we do is testing. So for writing tests, we again start writing simple scripts. We have a dedicated module called unit test, which provides unit test support for all kinds of script languages like JavaScript or Python. Again, I have a preparation phase where I load my modules, set up the reader, and then I write a simple test encapsulated between start and end test methods. And just doing a reset, bring everything to an initial state, send the very first command, and check that there is a response. 
Normally, you would have expected some kind of assertion method here. Um, we do have assertion methods like assert true, assert false, assert equals. This is all part of that unit test module. But we can provide additional assertion methods if we like to. So any module that we have in ease can additionally push assertion methods to users. So we have special methods to check for responses, to check for valid authentications and things like that, to simplify the scripting life of users, to simplify the script itself. So this is quite readable to users. To run tests right now, we use so-called test suits. This is just some kind of brackets. You're providing different test files where I can select, enable, or disable them. I could provide variables if something changes or is volatile in my system, like the name of my hardware asset I'm using. I can provide it as a variable here and dynamically use it in my scripts. If I run these tests, I get a few quite similar to what you know from JUnit. I can see all the files executed. I can see the tests. You have editor linking, so if you click on a test, it directly prints you to the line where the test is actually started. You can get test results, and obviously, if I remove my passport, those tests are going to fail. Because the TARD is not there, you get error markers in your workspace telling what went wrong and things like that. So this is pretty much what our users do with ease scripting and with uh, the script framework at all. So all these nice things you might have seen, like augmentation of toolbars and things like that, is not the primary focus of our test engineers. Now, when it comes to deliver the tool, you've seen we use a lot of scripting. So how do you train users? How do you teach them how to use the tool? We tried a lot of different things. Some of them worked well. Some of them didn't work well. I'd like to show you what worked well. <laughs> Maybe you can get some, some benefit from this. <coughs> First thing is, if you have dedicated tasks for users to do, provide them with perspectives. Don't put any fuels online that users don't need to not confuse first-time users. If you've got complicated tasks, it might be a good idea to have a dedicated view for it. So before you can communicate with a chip card, you have to activate the chip card. And this is quite a complex process to do. So this is kind of a training material we provide to our users. They can just say, reset the card and step through all these things you have to do to activate a card. They can click on dedicated states to bring the card into that state and experiment with that system. This is a learning software, right? So provide these things to your users, especially if they are new, they want something to click. Users that are long-term users of your system, they prefer scripting. They want to have keyboard shortcuts and things like that. Second thing we started with is classic help. Well, and then we recognized that users don't use help, and we asked them why. So the first thing we heard is, well, I've opened help, and there is help on how to read help. What the hell? <laughs> I just wanted to find something in help and not to learn how to use the help itself. Second thing is you've tons of, of different documentation on the left hand side, but it's hard to find the correct one. If you have no clue what this is all about, where do I get started? So we try to help them. And instead of telling them open the help, we try to bring the help closer into the UI. We had a look at editors and editors have these nice tool tips. When you hover over them, you get HTML enabled help. And this was not available for anything outside of editors. So we ripped it out of the editor framework and now have these nice tooltips available for anything that you can push into SWT. So the help text you get here is still part of our help system. We just extract it dynamically from the HTML files and display it in these nice hovers. So I can also right click on things and open the help and it, it'll bring me to the exact help page that I just visualized before. So it's a good thing, bring users closer to the help. Or if you, want to open, uh, if you want them to open help, show them where it is. Same thing comes true for our hardware devices. For example, we've got right click and help buttons everywhere in the system. Next thing that Eclipse does in a well complicated way is preferences. So if you open up preferences, this is nice for experienced users, but first time users have no clue where to get started. <laughs> and what effect it will have to change something in here. So if you think that your users should look into preferences and should change something there, it might be a good idea to provide buttons to bring them to the right page and show them where they should change something, where you expect them to work with. So try to put this almost anywhere in UI where you think users need help. The last thing we did is we added a new view called the tracer. It's hidden down here. The tracer is basically 
a logger. We weren't happy with the loggers that are out there for some reasons. First one is all the loggers out there have, or a lot of loggers out there have channels where I can post things to. We didn't think this is flexible enough. Instead, we exchanged that by keywords. So each log entry we now issue has some kind of tag cloud you can attach to it. And you can filter on these tag clouds or colorize things on these tag clouds and so on. Second thing we changed is we do not um, log text, we log objects. This is for a reason. Normally, you want to visualize stuff. But for example, we are logging each and every communication we do from our system. By having these as an object in the tracer, I can later on retrieve all the communication that a user did and automatically create a new script from that, for example. So this is a nice thing to have. Um, and the last thing actually I like most about the tracer is it has structure. You can see it's not just a table, it's a tree viewer. We did a, a authentication before, if you remember right. And authentication is comprised of two high-level commands, which actually are denoted as low-level commands, which result in device communication with my hardware device. So by collapsing and expanding things, you can dig dive into things that didn't work well. And the nicest thing about this, all this structure is generated automatically. So when you set up a log message from your source code, you don't have to provide that structure at all. It's created from the stack trace that we get from the Java engine. So back to the slides. We've had some topics, so remember the workflow. Guide your users wherever you can. Um, help system. We have a tutorial of how to use these help hubs online on Code and Me. If you want to reuse them for your purposes, I will I will set up the slides later on. You can find them at, at the talk attached to the talk description. Logging of tasks, the tracer we've got right now is closed source and just used at Infinium. But if you're interested in an open source version, well, let me know. We can discuss the topic. Um, now, what can you do to do user bonding, to bond your community? One of the important things is keep them updated. Tell them that you're actively working on your system. So post news about it. Post about new features. Post about tutorials you do. Have release meetings. Release meetings are always boring if you just show them PowerPoint slides or tons of bugs you fixed. Show them live content. Show something that changed, and you will attract more and more users. We had one issue with users that didn't want to upgrade quite frequently. So when they had the Sysbox version, they were happy for years sometimes. So we invented a thing called Name Lottery. If you remember the splash screen, the naming scheme of Sysbox follows the naming scheme of Eclipse. So first version was Sysbox A, followed by Sysbox B, and so on. And we have a dedicated topic for the names we pick. So we ask users, do a bet on the next name of the Sysbox release. And when we ship the next release, we just tell them, the release is out, just grab it. We don't tell them how it's called. So they download that stuff just to see the splash screen to see if they won the lottery. <laughs> this is a real nice thing to push things out. It works. <laughs> Second thing is about trainings. We had, in the beginning, first workshops that lasted two or three days, showing them everything we can do. And we totally overwhelmed users by this. So we had a look at Eclipse cons, what they do. And lightning sessions were the successor of these long workshops. 10 to 20 minutes focused on a single topic, having video recordings for offline viewing later on. If you do this for a time, you get a large database of talks of things that users can consume offline without asking for a new training. Support channels. The more you've got, the better. Some users like to call you over phone. Others prefer a bug tracker. The more channels you've got, the more info you get from users, and the better you can help them. Then we had a problem with first level support. We are a very small team of developers getting a large user base in a short time, so we were overwhelmed by all these support requests. So we had a look at Steam and, and what they do. They have this early access community. So we asked users out there, um, power users out there, actually, if they want to become special users for us. We tell them, you will get premium support from us. You will get early access to new features. You will get early access to betas before we release stuff. We will ask you some design, if you have design decisions to take. The only thing we ask you for is help your teammates in your team by setting up Sysbox in our tools. If they have some beginner questions, help them out. They did it gladly. <laughs> so they were, they were eagerly coming and being our power users and helping out their teammates. The benefit we also got from this is if you have a a silly question, let's call it that way. People didn't want to go to the development team, so, <coughs> but they rather asked their teammates for help. So we got more help out there to the users, which was a good thing to do. 
Now we had our user base established and we thought, well, there's other departments at Infineon doing almost the same thing than we do. So how can we start sharing stuff and collaborating? First idea was easy, just release the binaries, push them out there, tell managers and engineers out there that it exists and let them use it for free. Well, this didn't work out. So users said, we don't have support. We don't know what happens if you just quit your job. We cannot rely on such a tooling. So the next step was logical, release the source code too. So we put up a Git repo, pushed the source code there, gave read access to anybody and said, you can fork that stuff. You can fix stuff on your own. But the manager said, oh, this is Java. Oh my god, I have C++ developers. I have no clue what to do with that source code. And anyway, it's too complicated. I don't want to start with it. So we had to find new tricks to, to lure developers into, to, into our group and into our tooling. We had a look at Eclipse, and Eclipse is providing this perfect CI infrastructure out there. So we've built up a similar infrastructure internally, and then we open it up for other external developers. We've got all that stuff. So we've got Maven builds using Tyco on Jenkins. We've got Sonocube for code quality, Garrett. If you stick to things that are similar to what Eclipse uses, you have a good guarantee that your build will work too, as long as Eclipse can build on these tools. Opening up that infrastructure is really a benefit and value, even especially first for managers out there. Developers see this only when the tools grow at a, a certain size. As long as you have a small tool, you don't have problems. But if things start to grow, you need things like that. Next thing we opened up were, was our test infrastructure. We have a lot of hardware assets, and hardware assets cost money. So not each department can just pay for that. So we opened up our test infrastructure to allow other departments to do tests on our structure and on our hardware assets. Next thing to do is all kind of process setup. So the easy thing is the coding guidelines. We first started doing this on a Confluent site, which is just a wiki, and just said, this is the code formatting style you should enable in Eclipse, but this doesn't work well. And forces by pushing all these settings to Eclipse project-specific settings. This automatically enforces and actually forces all the people that are using your project to obey to your rules. So this gets a consistent look and feel of all your code. Again, stick close to what Eclipse does, because when it comes to debugging at a certain point, you got to debug into Eclipse code, and you want to have a, a break in the code style then. Bug handling process, code review process. When anybody starts contributing, they want reaction times. Eclipse is actually really bad at this. At Eclipse, if you file a bug, the worst thing that can happen is that no one reacts on this for years. Users that have a problem do want a reaction, and they do want it fast. So have processes that have guaranteed reaction times to them. Doesn't mean you have to fix stuff right away, but tell them you know about the problem and you're considering this. So for all these processes, it's important to actively communicate that stuff. Don't put it into a wiki and let it rot there forever and no one will find it. Tell them you've got that stuff. Focus on a simple setup. When people really want to start doing something, they got to check out your source code. They need to set up an IDE and oomph is for us at least the tool that will do all these things. So it will not only install all the plugins we need, it will install a JDK. So all our developers are using the same JDK. It does a source checkout and um, working sets to organize your workspace. It sets up the dreaded target platform, a thing that no, no first time user will ever want to think about, right? And you can also do things like launch targets and add these to your run configurations automatically. If you're sitting in a larger company, you might sit behind a proxy. That happens to us. And this proxy is very restrictive. So if you've got things like that, try to come up with local mirror servers for all your P2 dependencies you might have. You can do this on Artifactory. You can do this using an Apache server if you want to. We use Jenkins for this. So we just download stuff on Jenkins and push this as artifacts again on the Jenkins jobs. If you can, try to lower the entry barrier even more. So the very first things users do in Sysbox typically, if they start writing their own code, is they want to provide a module, which is just a plain plug-in project with a small Java class in there, and that's pretty much it. So we've included PDT, the plugin development tools, into Sysbox that first-time users don't even have to download a, an Eclipse IDE. They just take the Sysbox they use on a daily basis and start <coughs> writing their first module in it. Help them wherever you can. 
There are other forms of contributions out there. So reporting issues is an important thing you want to have as a project. We had problems in the beginning that our users didn't like the internal bug tracker we use at Infineon. So we've invented a contest called the Issue King, which means during a release cycle, we accumulate all these issues coming from users. And the one user with the most issues reported gets a small giveaway during the release meeting. It's a t-shirt or a coffee cup, things like that. But it lures users to push all kinds of strange <laughs> issues to our bug tracker. You can get artwork from users. Some of your users might do trainings because they are better in a certain area than you are. We have users that are very skilled at device communication. I have no clue how the oscilloscope works, for example. But users do. So ask them to give a training on that. Remember these lightning talks we had in the beginning. Promotion is also a very important topic. If I promote my topic, the thing I'm doing, it's not as good as if someone else tells the people out there, this is good tooling. Reuse it, please. Finally. But not least, give credit to anybody that helps and steps up doing something with your tooling. So we have an award for the best contribution from an external, for example. We've got a Hall of Fame where all these winners we had before are permanently written down. And you can look it up for 2014 and, and whenever. Users really appreciate that. Finally, if people like what you're doing, but they don't like your product name because it might be bound to your department or things like that, allow for rebranding. They're still using your libraries. It's still your work. They still fix bugs in your framework. So the name is not the issue. Just care about the content. I hope you got some ideas how to leverage the power of your user community and developer community. I would ask you to rate the talks. If you do, please don't just click on plus one or minus one. Put a small note to it to let me know what was good, what was bad, what did you expect. And if you've got any more questions, I'm open to take them now. Please. How many users uh, does the support have? Roughly 180. Um, I'm interested in other user interface components that you've added. So you've created lots of modules. I saw the device manager. Mm -hmm. That's custom. Is that yeah. actually a set of modules inside? No. The device manager is really actually it's similar to the device manager you've got in Windows. And we use external tooling to connect to these devices. So we don't use Java for all these things. We have a lot of USB ports to connect to and serial ports. This is not nice if you want to do it from Java. <laughs> Any more questions? You've got is one, Eclipse, right? Eclipse, they are running in the same uh, virtual machine as, uh, Java, uh, as Eclipse or on a different one, on a separate machine? Swissbox, you mean? Um, Sysbox or your easy uh, environment in, in general? No, it's just running in one Jerry. In, in the same, no, no, in the same virtual machine instance. As the script, as, you mean? As the Eclipse. The itself. script is running in the same instance, yes. Okay. So the Rhino engine we've got here is just an Eclipse module. Mm -hmm. And we just call that Eclipse module and say execute. So the Rhino interpreter is running on the same runtime as Eclipse itself. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why it has access to everything that sure. Eclipse offers. Mm -hmm. Um, for Rhino, we did not implement them because you would lose all the benefit, <laughs> actually. Um, what we've got for Python is that you can run an external Python interpreter. Mm -hmm. We have two implementations for Python engine. One is Jython, which is also a Java-enabled version, but it only has support for Python up to 2.7, which is rather outdated right now. And we've had another connector, or we have another connector for an external Python interpreter, which is called Py4j. There, the interpreter is really external, but we have some kind of bridge between Java and the Python world. Okay, another question. Sure. Is, uh, Reno scripting engine, is it from Apache or from From, from, from um, Mozilla. Mozilla. It's Mozilla. So it's, it will be still there after Java 11? Yes. Because they, they plan to remove some JavaScript engine again. Well, Rhino is pretty much, it's not really abandoned. There is a little bit of work going on there, but not much anymore. But it's, it's stable, it's usable. Um, on the other hand, we have the Nashorn engine in yeah. Java. And Nashorn will be probably dropped by Oracle, mm -hmm. as I've heard. But Oracle has a new scripting engine right now. They have a new effort to do so. And this is a scripting engine that can do it all. It will do JavaScript code and Python code in mix and match mode and things like that. So it's really interesting, but it's just a proof of concept right now. It's not ready for production yet. Do you plan to support a single Java file, like a scripts? Uh, it's already supported. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
There's also a module where I can dynamically create an instance of a Java class, which you have in your active workspace. So without launching something, you can just write a Java class and right away instance it in your ease engine in the same Eclipse. We are not bound to scripting languages. No, no. Okay. We have some kind of meta languages, like this test suite file. Is, there's also a script engine that executes these suite files, mm. which is basically kind of meta thing that launches multiple script engines. You've got a question. <laughs> Um, you had a slide where you showed your shared infrastructure mm -hmm. and your shared infrastructure for testing. S do these tests, can they run headless? Yes. Okay. Yes, there is a dedicated application. It's also available in the Eclipse help if you look it up, right? <laughs> a headless means then in a different virtual machine. No, it, it just means we do a headless run of, of Eclipse, actually, oh. and that executes a script. Yeah, and that script could be a test suite, for example, or just any other script you'd like to. We use it on our Jenkins build servers. Like we run these tests and create JUnit output so for our tests. Usual headless script application. Yes. Usual. Yes. Any more stuff you're interested in? If not, I'm here for the cold conference. Just reach out to me. Grab a beer and meet me <laughs> in the foyer. Thank you very much. <laughs>